Hello. Hi, finally. Hi. I think I think I, I, I have accomplished something. Yeah. <laughs> I have accomplished hear? something. Yeah, yeah, I can. Good. We can hear and see each other. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's so awkward. Uh, thank you. I I'm sure that you haven't met a person technically challenged um, like like me. <laughs> so welcome I, to the I'm, Insta Live. I'm I'm pretty challenged too, but I'm slowly getting the hang of this. You know, slowly. <laughs> So I, I mean, it's my first. I, I think you are. You have been pro all this while conducting interviews and you know uh, participating in the interviews for your most recent work. So for all those who have just joined, I must tell you that Janvi Varwa, uh, her Wikipedia bio says that she obtained her MBBS at Guwahati Medical College, but does not practice medicine. It is as if insinuating her. <laughs> in that case, I'll be working in a, a engineering power plant and not here con conducting this discussion with Janvi. Uh, she was awarded Charles Wallace Trust Fellowship for Creative Writing in 2006. She has been on the shortlist of illustrious and prestigious awards such as Man Asian Literary Prize, Commonwealth Book Prize for her previous works. Uh, she has written a short story book uh, called The Next Door, and uh, her first novel was Rebirth, and Undertow is her second work of fiction. I mean, a novel. Um, in Undertow, um, she has deftly portrayed the personal and political, while the story stretches. uh uh you know through her literary prowess the prose i mean it was brilliant uh, how the arc is spanning around, across 25 years and it's it's almost like uh, there is some reconciliation that the granddaughter is looking for but that's not happening and uh, it closely um, you know uh, uh, discusses and uh, sees um the ties that bind us um th those ties which are geographical those ties that are familiar those uh, those uh, those ties which are you know um it it becomes um as one's being like if i am someone that i am defined by my ties but that search that eternal search remains unsuccessful somehow and somehow it almost feels like that what what the granddaughter aspired to do she did accomplish so uh, thank you so much for writing this work i just wanted uh, you to tell me something about like why you thought so that i mean you know a story comes to you uh, how did it come to you why you felt the need to write it uh i think in um, undertow was exploring some themes which were um, very close to me uh, some some uh, issues which i've been thinking about for a while and um, while i have explored those issues before in a lot of my short fiction uh, the issues of home the issues of uh, uh, family relationships issues of relationships between friends uh, your engagement with your uh, political space the place you grew up in i have i have uh, dealt with them before but um, in this i somehow wanted to get closer so this is uh, as you know when you read it it's a very um, a uh, very intimate portrait it's about a young woman and um, there's a urgency to her narrative because she um, as at a point in her life where she feels she is uh, losing out on something and she wants to take a very different step in life and she explores for me uh, the issues of home homecoming the issues of where do i belong the issues of what do i do in life uh, the issues of rifts and disruptions in a family so through her i explored a few issues which uh, I do find very interesting, which I um, have been engaged with for some time. That that's how how this book came about, I think. And it's very interesting. So the book came out um, just pre-COVID and just post NRC, post CA, and uh, and and I absolutely didn't plan for it because, um, as a lot of you know, this took me almost yeah. eight to nine to write. And um, even when the book went out to Penguin Random House in October, we never thought this would um, uh, any of those events would take place. So it it kind of um, it's quite. Um, Oh, it is almost strange how it sort of tied into the absolutely. When I was reading, it was looking like almost topical because you yes. know the subject of nationalism is uh, right there, and you know the fir very first sentence, you know, it sets up the stage for so many things because it it goes at as if things were not bad enough. The morning of her wedding, the All Assam Students Union declared a band. That very sentence it weaved a national narrative and a personal narrative for me. 
and and i knew for sure that these two are going to be explored in this book because that's what that first sentence uh, said this uh, you know the tone for it i just wanted to know from you that um, when when certain intimate portals uh, port portrayals are written in fiction what part of personal do you think seeps into it it is for me i don't i i take care not to bring in um, really personal facts or personal events into my fiction having said that um, of course your personal experience for me in this case the politics of assam the politics of leaving your Absolutely. hometown for a new place uh, the politics of um, you know the northeast versus the rest of the country obviously will seep in but uh, having said yeah. that it's uh, you try not to put in real characters real events um, sort of um, two personal details in, into a work because that would be too easy that's almost cheating i mean um, after all this is yeah. fiction so you need to exercise your imagination to some extent um to to that extent yes i would say the personal does seep into the book and um, and the second thing was uh, when i was reading it um, it was it is intimate but you know the interesting part is it's a third person narrative so it it almost looked like there's a storyteller and he is telling he or she is telling you the story of a girl loya of this girl rukmani and you know how it's it almost looks like a my next door neighbor and my aunt is telling me that you know rukmani used to live here and her mother usha was very upset when she married a, a person who was an outsider and that and she and and i i i'm imagining that on a festival um you know uh, we are discussing about some other someone's life and she is telling me that she is now in bangalore and uh, you know her husband has left her her and you know the dot the granddaughter is here it almost looks like the book is celebrating the storytelling tradition in assam that is is that the reason why the third person narrative is so obvious and natural to this book um there was actually another more pressing reason because um, i have the grandfather right so in this book there are actually in a sense two protagonists there is loya and uh, there is torun also and uh, in fact that's why it's so long to write the book the grandfather because um, i wanted both their voices to uh, come out with in full force so if i had done a first person i for loya there's no yeah. way i could have drawn torun in as closely right so although it gave me a little bit of distance from loya using the third person point of view i had no choice because i wanted to include torun um, as closely so that really was the first reason why i chose this particular whereas when you really want to strike intimacy immediacy for any writer it's so easy to pick up the first person absolutely especially in a memoir kind of setting especially in a uh, talking of family relationship setting but to me i had to draw in torun equally so um, for me it, there really was no choice in this absolutely and talking about torun um, um i i always have a sense when when we are reading about someone some characters um there's certain pace and certain words that you use for those characters which actually define what they are so for tarun those words were used you know impeccably uh, well and how his relationship you know uh, usha is almost like a shadow and a very dark one it 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 remains throughout the novel it is not that you can't uh, eradicate from uh, this uh, her presence from the book but there is torun's presence which is like that of an elderly person because sometimes when you need them you go to them but sometimes when you don't they are not there so would you like to discuss the presence and how do you how you, how you weave the narrative in a way that you know uh, the the most precious characteristics of a person uh, you know comes out very well there I think uh, this is an endeavor all writers whether novelist or a short story writer or even somebody just uh, even doing a non fiction narrative um I think the the rule is when we're trying to um, build up a character we will want to use those few um, traits which will bring out exactly what we want to say about this character so for torun while um, he's an older person so you know in his physical appearance yeah so was it difficult because you know there are certain ages playing around you know there is this 25 year young um, ferocious uh, lady who is very independent and wants to go out and uh, you know study elephants in kaziranga national park uh, uh, it almost looks like uh, uh, you know uh, dream like setting for me because uh, i have not said uh, uh, signed up for an adventure like that 
and then yes. you have a tour of ram goswami whose life is very slow and then there is brahmaputra i almost felt like river is the character of the uh, novel in the in the novel i never yes. felt like that river was not part of the story river was part of the story as it this this uh, sentence a city under siege and only the river dare disregard it i mean uh, it it almost felt like that uh, the river is also uh, i mean you know a raging character here absolutely i think the brahmaputra is very much a character in this book and um, with that sentence you said you know i personified it almost he, he yeah. almost become you know in the book yeah. and you know we had this very contrasting characters like you said um, loya so she's young uh, she's uh, very modern she comes from a, a place very far away from this uh, sort of backwaters of of assam and um, she also has come with a fair amount of anger so for, for for to fashion loya it was um, uh, but she also is a very vulnerable person she's an affectionate vulnerable person very vulnerable so, very calm very observant very, very observant very very practical so far but right now she's losing yeah. a bit of her balance you know she is getting emotional but so far for such a young child to deal with so many disruptions in her life she has managed quite well so you know it, we had i had to build that sort of a very complex rich character so also with Tor- torun what you said he is a old man now but he was young he was 25 years younger yeah. when he was leaving and That's he's been in a position of power he's a civil service officer so he's used to making his own decisions obviously but in this very critical decision about his own daughter he couldn't take the final decision his wife took it you know Seriously. so all this yeah. like all this has to um, which is why it perhaps took me some time to write because i have to have this very complex character who has to ring true so when you look at a toru now sort of you have to um understand empathize and feel that yes all this is possible from from the Absolutely. way of portrayal yeah so, so so these things took time because they're very very complex characters and neither none of the characters in the book uh, are, are too expressive they they're not too many showdowns they're not too many long conversations so just from little traits i had to um, like for loya i said um when she first approached the yellow house that she was uneasy when she was angry because she was not someone who questioned her decisions just one line i had to put that she was a very confident person you know but this time she's definitely questioning all her decisions you know so Absolutely. little bits of hint in there to foreshadow the what happens later yes and her personal life as well you know the layered narrative because uh, she is not dealing with one thing at a time she is dealing with so many things at a time and then um, uh, she's always you know sort of um um uh, calibrating her relationship and how her relationship will you know turn out to be um uh, vis-a-vis her mothers because she she uh, her parents uh, separated way too early and that was a shock of her life and then when she is uh, you know uh, getting into a relationship with someone she is um, was that an expect uh, was that expect explored because i see that certain tension there because when she is getting on a call a phone call with uh, her boyfriend do definitely because and the little uh, hints which are strewn throughout the book wherein she is very very cautious in how she deals with people in general although she's calm absolutely she's very cautious in how she deals with a mother with a grandmother with a friend because she doesn't want um, any more losses she doesn't want any more relationships broken and with roy the man in her life her current boyfriend she's even more careful because she's seen how uh, her mother has lost her relationship she's seen um, so many family ties break and here she is cautious not to stress roy out she's in fact perhaps bending over too much backwards in in every step with him yeah. so she's a very cautious person by heart and this is the first time that she's uh, uh, actually taken um, a step which may prove dangerous for her so far she's been careful yeah. not to step into dangerous territory yes in in a dangerous territory as yes uh, and sometimes it looks like it came very easily to her because um, uh, with so much uh, going on with her life she felt like this is an easiest thing to do to just you know pack your bags and leave for an adventurous thing like you know uh, studying there but it 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 was also i think it the narrative is so layered that you you can't feel it's not over that she has decided to do something about her relations her mother's relationship with her father and she very well wants to address it 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 is the you know yeah it's the narrative which is doing that thing for us but, but no one is saying overtly that she is going to reconcile the relationship and in in the demeanor of torun and everything that's going on in that house uh, you know it almost looked like it's a doleful bungalow 
the yellow house and you know the energy of lawyer is i mean the house can't contain the energy of lawyer the decisiveness of lawyer uh, because there is this brahmaputra there is this uh, uh, you know sense of alienation uh, among the people in assam and and a sense of angst um, um, among them and here is this uh, lady who is so decisive who is so assertive and uh, she all she almost says this with you know uh, a Uh, when when Tarun was discussing, and she says that uh, what uh, what about these uh, homes? And uh, he he was he was so disenchanted. He was like, you don't know your history. But at the same time, uh, a family has disregarded her daughter because she has married an outsider. But the burden on the grand daughter is still there to remember the history. How interesting is that? Yes, it's it's kind of the political, the personal are woven together, and um, yes, lawyer uh, seemingly comes on just uh, academic work, and um, but as it unfolds, from the point she steps into the house, you see that she herself realizes that she's. I'm not sure even she realized that she was coming to look for this. Yeah. yeah but um, that really was the actual motive of I think stepping into her mother's hometown, homeland. Yes. Because because sometimes we don't know. I mean, I I just like this place. We just say it. like that i just like this place but there's a deeper uh, you know um, um deeper sense of belonging to that particular place that we we strongly believe in it we want to go there we want to see uh, it almost looked like that she was going to explore the place and uh, to know her mother it yes, it, it because there's a cold bond between the mother and daughter i mean there are two uh, a fairly uh, um, you know uh, under discussed but overtly there a uh, bonds between daughters and mothers which is usha and rukmini and uh, rukmini and loya where rukm uh, where usha says that over my dead body when she will marry and the second thing is uh, when when you say when you write that usha allowed arun her uh, rukmini's brother commodious space to conduct his own life that's a very interesting thing yes. to say and I mean, that's, but that's... that commod sorry 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 go ahead Tell me. No, no, continue. So that commodity space, however, is allowed to lawyer, but there's still a, a you know, uh, um, there's still a security to be gained. There, there's still some sense of estrangement in their the relationship. It almost looks like one or the other is taking revenge of something. Um, yeah. So in, in right in the to address this um, one point. Uh, between orun and um, rukmini obviously uh, which happens in so many of indian families the boy was given much more latitude yeah. just being a boy, boy child being a son he had uh, access to so much more freedom than rukmini could ever dream of and not only in his choice of college he was allowed to go to delhi to study he was allowed to eventually marry um, a woman from another caste so if you're going to be so particular about caste you were not so particular with the boy with the, with the son but you were so um, Uh, radical he was so uh, entrenched towards a girl that she should not marry out of community that you let her go you almost you lost her right Absolutely. so that, uh, the comparison there is i think something which happens so often i think all of us if you look around you'll find at least you know you can every fifth person we know has gone through this uh, there's been some difficulty with an inter caste or inter religion marriage and um, the contrast with a boy and a girl a man and a woman comes out very clearly here you say lawyer had commodious space but actually not so sort of. Rukmini didn't okay. have the same. Uh, Rukmini didn't have the same um, uh, sort of perspective. She she was not fussy about caste or religion and things like that. But she did want Loya to um, perform to her tune. Uh, there was yeah. a big concern uh, about wanting to do the elephant behavior, ethology, rather than study yeah. medicine. That Absolutely. that battle, Loya won. And in everything else, I mean, the way she conducted her life, in which once she was divorced, she said, "Okay, I'm going to now." I've been thrown out. I'm now going to live this very small life. I'm not going to make an effort with the world. I'm not going to go out there and make friends and call people home for dinner. So while she had lived her life as a young woman, she had been married. She's had a daughter. She's a working professional. She's a doctor. Um, she's in a sense lived her life, but she uh, closes the life up. She shuts the, her and a lawyer's life into a small box. But lawyer has barely begun to live her life. There's nobody coming home. There are no dinners. Uh, they don't go out to celebrate anything. They don't go out for a movie. So, and those were Rukmini's terms. So, she also didn't really allow Loya that much space. She had different parameters of um, what, that I want you to behave this way. But uh, she also was a fairly um, dominating mother in that sense. In a in a colder sense, she wasn't as 
um, sort of vocal as uh, Usha was, was yeah. a very strong yeah. quality. Correct. Yes, but she was. She was. She was. She was not attentive to her daughter's needs. And this this dynamic is what uh, stirred Loya into action. That if I continue like this, uh, I, I'll never escape this box. You know. So I think at this point in her life, there was an opportunity. There was a so-called face-saving opportunity that you can go to your study in Assam on the elephants instead of in yeah. the South Indian forest in Nilgiris. And she took that and she said, "Let's happen. Let's see what happens along the way." And that that's how it unfolded. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Let's see what it happens. Uh, you know, um, there's this line. um in the beginning when rukmini is about to get married as if people and events from afar but below this same sky were calling out to her to leave her safe harbor and sail into unknown alluring waters towards them it yes. it this resonated when loya was so decisive to leave and this as well when rukmini was decisive to leave because rukmini could only see uh alex being her man Alex being her man, and she wanted to marry him. That's it. And lawyer then decided. Uh, so, so this, so that's what I was saying. There was the, this leaving, uh, this departure from one of this time from one territory to the another, and in the other from one sort of a relationship into uh, and you know uncharted waters was very uh, contrasting and also complementary. um the the reactions usha's reactions and how rukmani's reactions in a way that rukmani and usha were never in touch but rukmani and loya still were uh when when she was there uh, she loya was uh, telling uh, rukmani about what's happening in the the yellow house and everything so uh, so in that way they're still more connected um and and yet lost and here uh there's a strange bond there's like they they bonded to each other but they're so so strangers here rukmani and usha what do you have yes. to say about that absolutely so the the first part when you said they both faced uh, i think a call they both responded to um a, a call to action so yeah. for um for rukmani it was uh, her end objective was to marry alex and she just followed him blindly to yeah. um for for loya it was a call to um set something right in her and her mother's life because yeah. whatever change in her life would change for rukmini too if she found some resolution there absolutely um, the, the, the spillover effect would definitely affect um, rukmini too so they both faced uh, around the same age they were both 25 and 25 a uh, call to action which which entailed leaving a familiar environment which entail leaving family and going into unknown water so they both kind of took the same call in reverse flow sort of rukmini came from assam to bangalore Yeah. And uh, Loya from Bangalore to Assam, right? So in kind of reverse flow, so that 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 exists. And um, Usha, being the person she was, she was very um, uh, sort of um, she was absolutely not flexible. So she obviously cut off all connections entirely. So there was no chance yeah. for Rukmini to forge any relationship beyond those times. In this case, it's not uh, that dysfunctional relationship yet. Although they really don't, uh, they really don't. Um, Uh, speak to each other, mother and daughter. Rupini and Loya too are not intimate with each other. I mean, they're it's it's a it's it's a strange paradox. Their their daily routine is very tied in closely. They only see each other, and yeah. you see how Loya cooks for her mother, makes a tea, they chat together, but actually they do not discuss anything intimate. And that Absolutely. again is is a function of many Indian families. You may love your children, you love your parents, but very often you find uh, kids cannot really speak. This new generation can, but our generation growing up. uh but it was a distance but it was too much deference or respect one didn't really speak one's minds with your elders right so um to a sense loya and rukmini have that relationship and um yet they're in contact and yes once rukmini is persuaded to uh, pick up the phone the first day she cut off the phone she said don't talk to me again but then she was obviously persuaded to speak to her they are in daily contact and somehow from afar uh they seem to be thawing there there seems to be a little bit more of a uh a more friendly interaction yeah. if they talk Um, politics they talk about um, the chana chur they talk about um, other things which they had not spoken of before so it yeah. almost seems to be th- um, the relationship from afar yes then uh, when you um, gave this comparison that um, we were not that open with our parents um, but it almost looked like um, that there was a danger uh, you know imminent danger there while opening up with your parents because then you will start opening up and uh, sharing things that you feel like from the bottom of your heart you might just end up you know disturbing them 
by saying things that you really wanted but you couldn't do so uh, m- maybe precisely that's what we measure uh, and you know allow ourselves to go that far when we are discussing with our parents and uh, i mean elders but especially our parents and you're absolutely right there's a, there's a wide communication gap even even now uh, i mean i'm not sure that uh, current uh, lot of generations can really open up and say whatever they want to um, of course there's a technological divide there as well because they are very re- really advanced uh, and they feel like it's it, it it's almost that they want their parents to know stuff but they don't uh, now uh, in, in um when when loya goes uh, to the yellow house she she discovers those vinyl record collections and she she was so astounded by it and it almost looks like tarun uh, tarun also was you know charged up and and there, there was some movement in the house and then uh, then tarun started actively participating in uh, in uh, you know uh, loya's uh, uh i mean constant integra- interrogation about the personal and whatever was going on in assam uh, i was just wondering if you have read fire in the mountain by anita desai i read it long long ago in school so that was like years ago i think you know when it first because came out. because loya and torun's relationship reminded me of the grandmother uh, and the granddaughter's relationship in fire in the mountain okay. and and it and this the parallel was striking the parallel was interesting because uh, here uh, here the uh, the the grandmother was completely uh, you know um, not interested in um, you know uh, participating with anything related to her granddaughter but here torun was a, you know uh, he he was liking that bit that resemblance with her daughter he 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 wanted is so very wanted to uh, cuddle her say things but but in a way he was disenchanted by the by her demeanor by her directness by her um, you know um, it it almost uh, sort of uh, felt like there is some uh, doppelganger here and um, but with a different mindset what do you have to say about that so torun you're right torun actually um Uh, wanted to reach out and um, connect he had he um, his 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 um, i think um, overpowering reaction was to uh, reach out and connect and you know get to know her it's been so long he all, all the missed years that he had not heard from rukmini the maybe through her that we are in road to rukmini's uh, life as well but somehow um, loya's demeanor as you say put him off because he is of that older generation and he did want her to be a little bit more perhaps polite a little bit more affectionate at times he wanted her to reach out so while he wanted he didn't want to make the first move so, absolutely so that uh, call it whatever you will call it um, uh, the old style of thinking call it his own ego sort of building up a wall but um, he wanted her to come forward a lot more you know and that wasn't happening but loya was a very different person from rukmini and although she's polite and she's uh, will be polite as far as um, normal day to day events are concerned but um, she has a whole lot of anger in her and she's been very independent and she feels she and her mother has been very wronged so she was looking for him to take a few more steps forward so this constant war about you know who uh, you know who's coming first i think uh, is what um, was kind of a barrier between them and torun uh, i think she made a few moves if she sat with him a bit more she got him a cup of tea he was only too willing to open up and that, be that turned him off <laughs> that that put him off that put him off and he, he wanted that old fashioned little bit of respect and that she wasn't giving you know that old absolutely and and torun was always second guessing his reactions his responses uh, with his best friend and and was analyzing through him and uh, robin was uh, telling him no this is not how you do just make peace with it just just be yourself uh, and just don't show off your ego sort of for this thing which we usually do when you have to reconcile because that's how that's what i remember uh, you know when when me and my grandparents had some feud then how they used to you know <laughs> find an another way to deal with the situation and be so calm and composed and very emotional about it that you just wanted to surrender everything <laughs> there and just wanted to make peace with it i i guess uh, somewhere down the line lawyer did uh, and uh, and it was a very funny situation when he was wondering about the appetite of lawyer <laughs> uh, how how could she eat so much because you know uh, that's also very traditional for women to be petite and eat less 
while uh, men of the family to be uh, uh, ferocious eat more and go out yes. so even even in that it's always uh been seen it's not not been seen as seemly for a woman or a girl to eat too much you know uh, but it's very for a man a big appetite is is a is a medal you know it's it's a virtue for women a uh, big appetite was not con- don't generally seen as a virtue an appetite in many other ways you can't have an appetite for food you can't have an appetite for ambition you can't have an appetite for uh, adventure or for doing things outside so yes um have are uh, eating a lot in a sense i put it out there to show that this is someone who knows her mind and knows what she desires and um she's not going to be uh, sort of um towing the old norms of being um subservient for light and you know having lesser ambition so that 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 definitely was one way of showing and secondly of course i used food as a device throughout the novel to show how deprived she's felt because for us in indian families food is a gesture of love so yeah, we show absolutely so how do how do our mothers aunts i mean uh, i remember my brother going to a hospital Still, my mother would be, you know, till the last making food and saying, "Take this also, take that also," you know. So, food is uh, the way we show love, and she um, actually she had to nurture the food in the house with Brikmani and her. She had to take over the kitchen. For well, the first time when she comes here, there's somebody who's uh, looking at what she wants to eat and is feeding her what she wants to eat, and she found that very, That's very it. comforting. It's a, it's a, it was a whole point of comfort for her. So, in two ways, appetite shows that she is. Um, been deprived and is looking for more and the fact that she's not somebody who's going to be restrained as much as rukmini was she is not going to be so shy about her desires yeah and then uh, when we talk about uh, river as a character um i just wanted to know how did you uh, you know there there's this almost like when there's so much happening in novel you want an extraordinary ending um which in a way i i did find that it meet every um sort of expectation that i had from the book uh in terms of the story what what how 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 did you how did uh, you know this happen to you this ending what what sort of uh, you know um what what sort of other alternates you had in mind while writing this ending particular because i i feel it's completely justified but still just want to know your thoughts that did when you were show uh, when you were asking reviews from your friends and etc they did they point it out um for me actually sort of there was no other ending this is the only way it could end this 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 is the only end which could give a really um which could provide deep meaning to the whole journey to the whole arc of the story without this most of the story would be meaningless because in the end um, undertow is a very cautionary tale it's a tale about what happens when you leave things too late and it's a, it's a story it's uh, almost a warning to say that uh, don't leave uh, things to fester for men to get so terrible that you can't uh, rescue uh, yourself from that situation later and um, so for me this was the only end and um, i was as far in any case when i write even a short story i know the end already so for me everything has to fit in very seamlessly so without an end i can't begin to write because i don't know where to take the first scene to the next scene because for me um it's many many steps to that scene where the end finally happens so unless i know that i'm going there and i then i know which path to take so for me it was very it was very clear that this would be the end and um i had a few um very trusted readers who read who read this and um the two there were two very strong reactions if you the split down the middle the people who loved it and said this is the only way to go and there were people who said oh no you can't do this you have to change this for us you know yeah and but i went with my instinct and it's very interesting the people who said no this is the only way it can go were writers were writer friends and absolutely said, no, you, you know because uh, as a writer they know the challenges they know the meaning behind the, this particular ending and the people who said no you can't do this were regular lay readers were readers but not writers so you see the divide there in perspective i'm i'm so glad that i asked you this because because i it, it was always in my mind that i i am dead sure that it it must have put many readers off uh in a way that they wanted something extraordinary to happen but in a way uh, the reading uh, the ending was always there in between the pages uh when when loya was uh, discussing this uh, uh i mean i have underlined this i guess uh yeah this time she couldn't shake off the feeling that she was making a terrible mistake one that would lead her into grave danger it 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 was almost there uh, and and brahmaputra was always there in the book um i mean running parallelly through the narrative 
uh, i don't know what else could be very befitting there yes. but but you're all but you're absolutely right that uh, writers must have all must have praised for this ending but uh, for others it must be have it must be a hard time that they wanted something extraordinary something cinematic to come here and uh, uh i mean you know uh, mend the relationship or something like that but you know when you say extraordinary and in a sense this is an extraordinary ending you know it's may not be to your taste you know but um uh, it certainly is, it was not it's not a tame ending in which uh, you know it uh, things end tamely this is um it's it, it ended with quite a sort of bang you know but um you're right when you say because that very line you you read out that um, this time she could this was she was uneasy she said yeah. she's never difficulty with her previous decision this time she felt that um, maybe this is going to lead her from somewhere where she would face some danger and um, i um, i don't know if you notice it you probably have i spend a lot of time crafting so it takes me a lot of time to write and i keep telling my when i when i teach little kids to write sometimes even adults i i say that um, you know don't be mistaken uh, for a good writer there is nothing in uh, on on page that is unnecessary and nothing's put there for no reason so if you find that somebody some writer is going on talking about uh, let's say leaves shedding uh, a tree shedding leaves understand this course had doing something something's going to fall or going to decline or you're going to lose something later in the narrative you know so i i i enjoy crafting and i and i really and, and it's thrilling when you pick this line up to me it's 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 wonderful if you pick it up and you understand that i'm telling you that this girl is going into danger you know absolutely so i i, I do put it there so it's there to be picked up that then the 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 hints if you go if you like and thank goodness for talking about this craft and everything because i always feel that um i mean only a great short story writer can write a book like that because you know it's so compact it's it's almost like an uh, i mean i'm i'm sorry for the analogy but it's almost like an atom bomb and it explodes in your face um, you know it's such lit Lit, in in literary sense it's such a rich novel that uh, each and every sentence counts each and every word counts every word is um, sort of moving the narrative forward in terms of either it's adding to the grace of the atmosphere either it's telling you something about the character or either is telling you about the imminent danger that is out there um I'm, i mean i i wanted to ask you but you already answered it in this way that um whenever you are writing a story that's how you keep the narrative going forward and that's what you teach uh, children too so absolutely because um, these are our tools right so so that the very first scene you're talking about when she's hesitating at the gate everything around her is oppressive the sun is high in the sky there are no clouds there's no shade she's sweating the bag is dragging so, you know yeah you hear but she hears a a, a, a honey bee somewhere that that buzzing of the bee which seems to be um, some sort of relief but how to get to that relief so every so as a writer you have to use every tool your entire sensorium uh, what you see what you hear what you feel what you taste um, to take the narrative forward so and i and i'm very conscious of that as i write i'm very conscious that every line every dialogue has to mean something it's not just put there um, you know just because you felt like it was just because it looks good or sounds good you know there there definitely has to be meaning behind every written word so so also so i think um uh, it's it's a small novel it's 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 51000 words it's less than 180 pages and uh, i perhaps could do it because i used every line you know with to full effect use it to full effect and you know make sure it uh, means something yeah and it shows it shows <laughs> no effort is wasted here thank you um Thank you so much, Anvi. Any parting thoughts? Because I mean, uh, it was great uh, discussing this book and your writing process and whatever which you could, which we could talk about about writing over here. So well, thank you so much. It was a very interesting, engaging conversation because it's um, uh, a book is about so many things. It's it's uh, it's a story first and foremost. then as you said you bring in we bring in politics we bring in uh, the state of life we bring in so many other sort of uh, contemplations into the book right and uh, uh, also there's so much of craft which i think which, which sometimes i'm disappointed in that you know people are just not looking at craft it's it's so Absolutely. much about what uh, the, the book sounds like looks like and you know um, all that is fine i mean you're out there to tell the story but part of telling the story is crafting and um, 
I enjoy I myself. See, I, I, I myself enjoy a very well-crafted story or a novel. And uh, I think um, what, you, what I enjoy is what I seek to put out there, which is why perhaps, um, and you said, because I think my, my, at, at, at the core of it, I'm a short story writer. I mean, I, I love my short stories. I love reading them. And I see the effort going into a good short story. And um, it, it's really impressive when somebody writes a good short story. So I think for me, in fact, what you said um, about it being like an atom bomb, somebody else told me, it was really funny. He said, you know what? I think for me, this was just one long short story. So I read it as a long short story. I said, well, that's, that's a good way to look at it. And, and increasingly, I don't know if you felt it, people said they couldn't put it down. So that's what happens in a short story. You want to end it, right? So people have read it through in one sitting and, and I'm happy and I'm happy it's been able to sort of grip them at that level. And um, yeah, and I can't emphasize to younger writers and readers in that pay attention to craft, even as a reader, and know what's a well-crafted story, know what story is, has, is a little looser than the next, you know, it's, it's, it's a good way to refine your sensibilities, your judgments and your tastes. Absolutely, because uh, I mean, I, I was uh, particularly amazed by the craft because each and every sentence and everything. And what you said about the long short story thing, I, I completely agree with that person because I also felt like that's it's a wonderful short story and it's a long short story. Uh, but I don't know uh, whether we classify this work as short story or a novel would be very, um, I mean, contesting. But what's more important here is the craft of it. Uh, the yeah. craft that goes into writing short story. Uh, if I mean, it. sorry, you were saying something. I mean, in the sense of, uh, of course, uh, you look at word count. Of course, it's a novel. Of course, it falls in that category. But I was talking about the way you need to keep it taut in a in a short story. The way you Absolutely. need to build tension, keep your scenes, you know, moving. In that sense, it reads like a long short story. Somebody else here, one of the readers, I couldn't get the name, has said the same thing. It reads, it reads like a really long short story. You know. Makes sense. I was wondering if but anybody an had endearing one. But an endearing one and, a, and, and an amazing one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just so, see in the chat if you have any questions. I think this people I've, are... I've had, some, I've had book believers say, um, tips to improve craft. That's a very good one. The one is to um, read, read and read. And like we just, just to take off from where we were talking, Saurav and I, is to read uh, so much that you know what is good writing. Once you can uh, understand good writing, just like you, when you eat a lot, you, you uh, taste a lot of food, you know what is a good curry, what's a good piece of cake, right? So understand what's good writing. And only once you understand, can you um, seek to even seek to replicate it, even seek to get there. So one is to read and then be a good reader and then begin to write. The second tip would be to, um, this, that's just from me. So um, less is more. For me, uh, always less is more and um, use your words wisely uh, and the standard things of don't use too many adverbs, don't use too many adjectives, keep your prose, your prose very taut, um, show don't tell, you know, all those things. And um, of course, at the core of it, no matter how well you write, um, if you don't have something to say, uh, I always say this, I say become a person first, don't be in a hurry to write, uh, understand yourself, understand what place you occupy in the world versus the world what are your how do you engage with the world with your family with your friends with your family legacy with your state with your environment with books films understand yourself thoroughly understand how you engage with the world and then start seeking to write because uh, then you will um, have something to say that we will want to hear right because anybody can write a good essay anybody can put up a good presentation it's not the english skills we are or the writing skills we're looking at it's really that new voice and that new thing you have to say so for craft, I would have these little tips. And sometimes I always feel like when you're writing, you're understanding yourself as well. So it, it may be that it, it may be that if you want to know more about yourself, you start spilling, you know, those words there and you start to see the magic what they create. But at the end of it, uh, when it becomes, uh, it, it almost like a baby. And when your baby is out in the world, it is going to interact with a lot of people. And when it's going to interact with a lot of people, it must have that potential and, you know, those skills that, you know, it can brave the ruthless world out there. For that, it needs to be taught. For that, it needs to be really good. And it, for that, it needs to be very uh, indigenous in its voice and everything, which you rightly pointed out. So that's why I always believe that when, when you are letting your word uh, out, a reader's time is precious. And Paul Oster said, I guess, that uh, the book complete, gets completed when a reader reads it. But when oh, you're making it difficult for the... Sorry? 
No, absolutely. What you just said is so it's so yeah. it's so important that in um you put the book out there, you put your baby out there, but honestly the text comes alive when a reader embraces it. It's it's when like you and I are talking and and you know, um I wrote law uh, in in almost isolation. I wrote um, Torun by myself and now to have someone else regard him, look at him, discuss him with me is when really you inject that I think that uh, life Absolutely. blood into the text. the text you know so this is so important when a reader picks up your work and maybe that's why you wrote it so that we can discuss those characters who were written isolated uh, when you were isolated and now they are in your drawing room and we are discussing about them i, th- I think everybody does that yeah they are talking, that. Yeah, they're talking sorry they are talking to us to us through your prose and uh, it almost looks like everyone is you know right there and we are discussing about them and they are ha- we are having a very engaging conversation and that's i guess the purpose of prose so that's what he said he ended that you do not have to make the job of reader difficult no that I, i don't believe in that i don't believe you have to be either that literary or um, you have to be that poetic in your prose or that obscure that you know you have to uh, confuse a reader i mean you can write Absolutely. very to write very beautifully very simply i think for me that's really an endeavor to make it simple but yet it has to be beautiful it can't be that flat and uh, that bare of any any charm you know it can be a uh, simple and charming and um, yet the reader should be able to really access it very easily and what you said when you asked me right at the beginning sir why did you write this um i i want to explore some topics and so i explored it through lawyer right and uh, now i'm exploring it through all of you so um yes you put a piece of text out there and it becomes an engage point of engagement with the world on really in that sense thank you so much thank you so much janvi i couldn't be impossible for without you you and without this book and it was a very really engaging conversation and i'm sure that all those who have joined us must have learned so much from this conversation thank you to all who joined us actually i saw a few friends there there's tina there's a uh, I saw Bipanchi as a sort of thank you all for coming in and being here. So Vivek, everybody, thanks for being here, and thank, thank you, thank you. you so much, thank you so much for hosting this today. Thank you, thank you. Your technologically challenged host says thank you. <laughs> I'm just about maybe just a fraction better. I could just get onto it. So. <laughs> it <was fun. laughs> yeah, it was. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.